Hey there, I'm Nutrix, and today we're looking into migrating from an old MacBook Pro i7 Intel chip to a MacBook Pro M1 Pro computer. I'll talk about how I decided to go with this one, because today you've got M2s and M3 Pros. Why the M1 Pro? Then managing the migration, because there's a there's a reason why I want to upgrade, not just because I want something newer, but I want to be doing some things. The software I'm using and the one I'm not sure I'm going to lose because migrating from these two computers also is a question of changing from Intel to silicone chip. So what am I losing and why should I prepare for? And I tested everything that I had on this one on this other one, this new one. And you'll see I'm surprised. I'm actually surprised at what actually does not work and what does work. I'll talk also about managing your licenses because when you leave a computer and you move to a new one, there's a lot of authorization that you have on it, this old hardware that you need to recuperate to, you know, uh, deactivate if you don't want to lose these licenses. So how do you do this for most of the software that I'm using? And what is actually the differences side by side of the two running the same song to see the differences in real life? And what are the new things that I can do with the M1 Pro that I didn't think I could be using? And in the case of the software that I'm going to leave behind, which one am I looking for to replace them? Let's just go. So i7 before we start in more detail about what we have i have an i7 retina display 15 inch from mid 2015. so this is like eight years old it's a 2.5 gigahertz intel core i've got 16 gigs of ram on this one and i have a one terabyte ssd drive that i changed myself on this one and this one i had to change the battery twice the first time they changed it because there was a defect and apple paid for it the second time it was after i think six years so it was not looked at uh, again as a problem but i did a video about it they changed the battery but the battery is glued to the trackpad right now in this one i've got a new keyboard a new trackpad a new battery that i changed like a year and a half two years ago so this will not go to the trash because it's still very powerful it's still a very good computer so it's going to be my wife's computer she has an Intel i7 also as a Mac mini, which is, I think, like two years older than this one. So she's going to have an upgrade. So this one is the MacBook Pro 2021, 14 inch, 16 gigs of RAM. I choose a MacBook Pro. I needed and I wanted to have at least 16 gigs of RAM and one terabyte of hard drive. For those who don't know, the MacBook Pros now M1, M2, M3. They're all fixed, meaning if you buy one terabyte of hard drive, it's fixed and it's sold it to the board, so you cannot change it ever. So you better do your decision right away to have the space you'll need. M1 Pro has a 10 core on the CPU, an 8 performance core and 2 efficiency core, and that's going to be an important aspect when you think about comparing the M1 Pro to the M2 and the M3 Pros. The performance core to the efficiency core so even if you go from macbook pro m1 to m2 I, I did read a lot about it and i did look at a lot of videos to compare the m1 m2 and m3 pros because that's where i want it to be what really differs from one to the other is that the m1 pro with the same amount of cores inside the chip you have more performance score on the m1 pro then in the M2 and M3, what they have is maybe six performance and eight efficiency core. Performance core makes it that the M1 Pro is a very good contender because it basically it has more powerful cores than the other ones. This will change as new version of OSs and new versions of DAWs are built for the new chips. They're going to be better at using the efficiency core, I'm guessing. But right now, it means that the M1 Pro today is still a very good buy. So what I have on the old one, just to be sure you understand what I'm leaving behind, I have Live 11, I have Zen Beats that I'm using, 
I have Reason 12, I have Studio One version four, which is an all one. I think they're at six right now. I have Arturius plugins, I've got UVI plugins, I have Isotopes plugin, but I have the other one. I've got the RX7 and Ozone 7. I have Cherry Audios plugin, I have uh, GeForce plugins, IQ Multimedia effects on this. Um, I have the Uno Synth Pro editor. I have Imaginendos plugins, I've got Moog, at least the one that they have on Mac. I've got Flight Acoustic System plugins, Novation Component software that actually manage the Novation Monostation internal stuff. I've got some Eventides plugin and I've got a Mutsu Clockworks Mark of the Unicorn, which is a, the software that manages the MIDI timepiece. And that's, that's something I'm not sure it will work. I also have the iLock software to manage licenses. So what's interesting is that most of them, um, when I did my migration, just to be clear, as I migrate, I've got my two computers. I basically do not want to have a copy of the old one into the new one. There's too much legacy stuff that's going to be moved around and will not work. So I wanted to reinstall from scratch. It was empty. I installed the latest update for Mac OS 13. I didn't go into 14 yet. I started to read about 14 and a lot of the software that I have, they say, wait until you we have a compatible, stable version for 14. So it's probably going to take another eight months. So I'm not rushing into it. I'm going to just have 13 and have everything working. And I'll be happy with that. So what I decided to go is to reinstall Live 11, Zen Beats, Reason 12, everything that was so newer version of these or latest um, install of even these old ones. So I, everything I installed it and everything seemed to work. But there's something interesting is like Rolling Cloud Suite, the Rolling Cloud Manager installed. But when I wanted to install software, it didn't work. So I got into looking into different um, update and there's something inside Mac OS 13 that is called the Rosetta 2 software. It's a shell that makes um, software made for Intel work in silicone based software. Basically means that you can run software not coded from M1, coded from in, for Intel that will work on M1 because Rosetta will do the conversion. So that's what's happening right now. <clears throat> so that was weird. I activated that and everything was installed. Even stuff that I thought would never work got installed and it worked. But after that, I was like, okay, it means that these, if I upgrade to 14 and they, they stop using Rosetta at one point saying, this is only for the new silicone chips. These old software that I'm using will not work. So let's try to get everything in silicone compatible mode. So then as I'm going over the next years, putting myself into the mindset that I should start thinking about new ways of workflow if I have to change software, because I'm going to have to do it in a year or two. That's pretty sure. So let's right away think about what can work and what cannot work. So I can, if I have to, I'll move it. What I found is that most softwares are now silicone based, even if the installer was not. And the Rolling Cloud Manager, what seems to be happening is that the Rolling Cloud installers are still in the need of Rosetta to install them. So something in it is Intel based uh, coding, but all the plugins are silicone coded now. Uh, at least the one I have. So I was really happy to see that they're all native and they run really well and fast. The one thing I wasn't sure is that clock works from Mark of the Unicorn, but let me show you some of the information that I got from these software. If you use Clockworks, for example, you have the information that it is a universal app. So it means it's been coded for Intel and silicone. So this will work correctly. You could also force it to open using Rosetta if you want, if you find it's not stable. But if you have others like Drambo, for example, and yes, there's Drambo, this is Apple Silicone, 
the GX80 from Cherry Audio. Most of them are universal right now because they want to be able to be installed on anything. The Unisynth Pro editor is an Intel only. It turns on Rosetta for it by itself, but it means that maybe in a year or so when it doesn't work anymore, I'm going to lose my editor unless Aikimulia released a newer version of it. And if I go into my older one, which was Studio 1.4, this one is Intel only. That's where you get into thinking about how much it's going to cost you to uh, migrate. The one thing that did not work at all was Isotope RX7. Now they are 10. So I looked into why am I using these and should I change my workflow right now? So the workflow I do is that for music, I don't use Studio One and I don't use the Isotope that much outside of the Insight 2, which shows me the LUFS as I'm mixing. But I'm using Studio One for an Isotope massively on all my videos. For the sound, I record and I treat the voice with a series of plugins in Studio One, and they're all, not all, but most of them are cleanup plugins from the RX solution. Voice denoiser, voice de reverb, the clipper and the clicker. All of these, they're part of my cleanup of my tracks. So my voice become clean so I can actually then compress EQ before I optimize my mix with the rest of the, the, the sound. So I decided, okay, let's say I move on to something else. What do I need? I need a software that gives me a console type of view so I can edit the voice and do my mix. It's not a complex mix. I have like four tracks maximum. The microphone recording, the software or computer rec recording, and I've got some of the ambience music that I put before and after. So should I pay an update from Studio One for that? No, by default, I could mix in Zen Beats or Live or Reason, and I could finish in there. But I like the Studio One interface, which is more like a traditional console, live mixer and edit, which I am fan of in this concept of mixing. Universal Audio, they have a DAW that is called Luna. It's made to mimic old hardware and tape recording and have that sound of going to tape. The DAW is free for Mac and it's recent. It only works with Mac OS 12 and up. So it's made for silicone. So I was like, okay, it's going to take the place of Studio One because I just need three, four tracks. Gonna be, so I'm going to do a video about how I mix this video in Luna. So my next video is going to be about mixing and editing my videos in Luna. Am I clear? <laughs> but the one thing that was still my problem is that I still need to have a noise reduction cleanup plugin for my voice. In my case, it was Isotope. Now, Isotope RX Element, the replacement, if you want, is 55 and 60 Canadian dollars. So not that much. I could update that. But my question was, I use this one because I had that one. But what else is there out there for just cleaning up the voice and getting it right in a post-production work? Icon Digital Restoration Suite, uh, 99 US. You have four plugins that do cleanup, noise reduction. You have the Stangberg Spectra Layer Element, which is about 120 US dollars. Again, plenty of different plugins there, depending on what you want. The Element is the cheaper most limited version, but you can even like take out the voice out of a track. If you want to do more restoration stuff, this is interesting, but I don't want to go too much into restoration. And anyway, I still have my licenses for the RX7 that I can install on my older Mac mini. I could put more RX7 on that one. So, and also there's Sonox post, but it's, it's just way too much. It's really like deep, post editing stuff. I really need like four or five dedicated to voice plugins. So in the end, after looking at everything else that was there, I went back to Isotope. 
and I bought the Isotope RX Element for 55 uh, Canadian dollars. In the next video, you'll see I'll use them to clean up the noise. But honestly, right now, there's not a lot of noise because this computer, the new one, does not make any noise. It does not create any type of fan noise unless you really, really push it to the limit, but it doesn't create any noise. Whereas this one, I just open, you know, a door and it goes, Vroom. this one, the fan. I think I heard it once when I tried to test everything to the max and that was it. Most time it, it did not even reach the need for the fan to, to turn. Now, migrating from this one to this one, as I said, I installed everything there one by one. It took me a day to download all of the installers and installed all of the stuff that I have and autorize it. And that's where we're gonna stop a little bit and talk about autorizing and deauthorizing. When you autorize stuff, it's easy. You install and say, do you wanna authorize? You go, yes. Worst case, you go somewhere to do it. But to deauthorize, most of the time we forget to do that or we don't know how to do it. So let's actually just do that inside this one, this old one, and I'll show you how I do it. So I'll go in Arturia Software Center. I log in into my account. When you're in your Arturia Software Center, you go just beside your name, you have a little arrow it goes into preferences of your account. In that preferences, you have licenses. And in licenses, you can synchronize your license to, of course, and you can remove all activation on this computer. So you go deactivate all and it will remove all activation. So now you retrieve them you put it back them into your Arturia account, so then you can install them on into another computer. So you don't even have to uninstall them, you can just trash it after that. So in your Rolling Clown Manager, you go into Settings, you have, I've got the Ultimate Membership, you go into Preferences again, and to Preferences, you have Manage My Devices at the bottom here. Click on it, it gives you the list of all the computers that have installed and you can deinstall it from the computer that you have. And with the Mac Mini, I'm going to deinstall it from this one. Your current device cannot be unsynced. So what I'll have to do is I'll have to open up my Roland Cloud account on my newer computer and unsync the old one. I lock. You sign in into your account. I've got 113 licenses here, and I could just take one, so this one, and put it on the hard drive. Okay, like this one is still Vintage Vault, it's still installed on this computer. That means that if I turn on the, the software, it will see it. So the only way to get rid of it, I could hear and say deactivate, and it will deactivate and put it back into my licenses that I have in the cloud, in the iLock cloud. So then I can go to another computer and I can reactivate the iLock itself, the USB iLock, or I can reactivate on the computer so then I don't need the iLock. So evolution, migration, and adaptation to new ways of working. That's it for today. That's it. I think that's enough. If you have any questions, put them below. Stay safe, make more music, and see you soon. Cheers.